We're here to answer your game, game or game night questions. So most weeks, we pick a question that someone sent to us by emailing questions at tabletopbellhop.com or filling out the form on our website, which you can find by clicking on Ask the Bellhop at the top of the page. This week, though, both Sean and I have a lot going on and didn't really have the time to do the research and pre-planning that's required for a full topic discussion. So we're taking the easy way out and hosting an AMA. Between health matters, sales, and other jobs, it's been a rough start to the year, even two months in. So a nice chat with our guests and a free forum discussion is always good. And in a way, I'm glad because I was thinking we haven't done one of these in quite a few months. And I know some people really do enjoy this format. And I know I do. And not just because it's less work after the fact, but also I love being able to interact with our chat room live. Indeed, we always seem to get some questions which make us work for it and <laughs> really think like that. What board game would you be question from a year or so ago? Oh, someone's going to ask us to re re revisit <laughs> that one and see if it's changed. Now, as for this AMA, we are going to be taking questions from our chat room here on Twitch, uh, twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop, for those of you listening or watching. Um, for the you folk in the libra li library, wow, <laughs> I'm doing great. For you folk in the lobby, feel free to ask anything you want, gaming related or not. Well, to give people the chance to get some questions in, we've got one saved from the feedback session section from Bob okay. Lai about the topic of how low a price has to be before we take a chance on a game. Bob asks, tangentially related, have you ever bought a game on the bubble and been genuinely, genuinely surprised by the product, its overall gameplay, or concept? All right, I should have done some research going through my board game geek list, but I didn't. Uh, <laughs> I knew this software was coming up, but I still didn't prep for it, which is just silly on me. Um, one of the things, we are talking about this now to give people in the chat time to get your questions in, so please send in those questions. All right, so back in the day, um, Boxing Day at Hugen and Munin, they had a bunch of Fantasy Flight Silverline games on sale, and they were 10 bucks each. And at the time, I had money from Christmas, and I probably had a gift certificate at that time, and I bought all of them. I literally bought every single one. And then there was a whole bunch from uh, Geochix, which I'm not sure if that's how I'm pronounced, but it's like Geochix dot, uh, Geochix or something, dot .de, and I bought a bunch of those. Out of those games, most were flops. There, there weren't a lot of great ones, but then there were some awesome ones like Citadels, which, yes, I know I complain about how I don't like social deduction, and I'll admit, Citadels has dropped for me, but I had no clue I was getting such a great, um, I don't even know how to describe that game. You're like city building while backstabbing each other and trying to collect tokens. It's like a race to victory points, but there's some social deduction because you're going to put your warrior down hoping no one else played an assassin to kill him. So it's not like the straight up bluffing where someone's taking on a role. It's more of a like like poker like bluffing. So that was one. Um, another one was there was a warehouse sale here, like a, one of those shops that suddenly opens up and has tons of stuff that they obviously got off a boat somewhere and are just selling it all off. One of those huge places. And they had a whole bunch of Z-Man games and other games for five bucks each in like seven for 30 or something stupid like that and out of that we got a ton of great games um some of the best ones were the zavendar game so there was mines of zavendar Dwar, and some dwarves of zavendar i think is the other name i'm not sure if deanna is listening or doing something else she might be able to remember some of these but those ended up being really good i still have one of them and another one we actually keep for our white elephants every year because someone has to put it in the white elephant every year and I was the one that got it last year, so I had to put it back in because it's just kind of a running joke. Um, I got Stefan Feld's The Speaker Stat that way. There was a Great Wall of China game, which I think was just called Great Wall. It's not the new one that everyone's going nuts over. But it, there was a uh, going crazy. Yeah. Going cuckoo over. That's probably still not it. I'm failing at my non-ableist word. Sorry. Going bonkers over. There we go. Failed there. Um, which had little plastic walls you put on that were color coded, and it was an action selection game where everyone had these things you put down. Oh, it was Gnomes of Zavendar. There you go. I was thinking dwarves, Gnomes of Zavendar. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and like that was actually really good. Um, the Vulgaria Eloquentia cost me three dollars, and this is a heavy euro where you're developing the English language, and it's a cube pusher where you're doing an action selection. So I have definitely gotten lucky. That said. There's more bombs than there were good. 
like out of those uh, rails in new england that was another one from z-man that i got in last train to nuremberg all like actually really solid train games but then for every one of those there is a senator which is one of the worst games i've ever played fancy flight excuse me fantasy flight put out this game called senator everyone we played it with hated it um surprised jamie's not in the chat tonight but i'm sure jamie would be shouting senator at the top of his lungs for one of those terrible games we got as part of that sale so definitely now sean have you ever bought like a cheap game that just didn't work out or, or was better than you thought it would be um I'm trying to think and not really um although i mean i suppose technically that uh uh that marvel uh strike force game not strike force but uh marvel yeah that was the one i was thinking possibly yeah. Uh, which was uh, a reason uh, there was more content in it. Now, especially this was deeply discounted on sale, yes. um, which was why it's it's that it's a cheap game. Um, but no, it was there's a lot of content. I mean, it, it was remarkably solid. Uh, I don't think it, it sunk in as well with my son as I'd hoped it would. So it hasn't gotten back to the table as much. But I was really surprised by how much there was in it. Yeah, though I think that's sixty dollars regular price. So. Yeah. would it be worth picking up at full price uh you'd gotta yeah. be you'd have to be a real fan i mean like it, if it's in the 50 that, to 60 yeah you'd have to be a real fan of that style of game and i think that was the thing with my son you know my son likes the marvel and stuff but the uh the the, the dudes on a map sort of skirmish concept wasn't really his thing nah not for him fair enough uh all right well next up we've got a question here from roger from the discord uh, what are some of the weirdest games you've played, and when does it get too weird to be fun? I might save that one for a full topic at some point. I think that'd be an interesting, like, top 10, top 20 at some point. Um, weirdest games. Um, the one behind Poseidon's Kingdom. <laughs> so Poseidon's Kingdom, which unfortunately I'm getting rid of it, um, you've got this board that shows the sea, like waves going up on a beach, and you have really well-crafted ceramic playing pieces that look like various sea creatures that are very cute. And you then set up a wave, it's called, and it's this cardboard mechanism. That you put a bunch of dice on, then you tip the wave, which causes the dice to kind of tumble out. And depending on where they land, they're food for all these fish things. And then it's actually like a rondelle, because you're going around the board, trying to eat the things to defeat the evil octopus. And it's it, it it hits that too weird part. Like the wave is just too random. Half the time the dice spill like right off the board because you tipped it too quick. And like I get the concept, but it was just like, just let me find a way to roll these instead of this stupid cardboard wave thing that's not that sturdy. And yes, the pieces are fantastic looking, but for the price of the game, it's it's like a gateway kids game that cost $80. Right. Like it's got the cute pieces, but then they're ceramic, which is awesome. And and I bought it because it was a really good sale. So kind of jumping back to the other question, but I, I did my research on this one, but this actually looks good. Um, I have no idea what it rates on Board Game Geek. Maybe that's something Sean can look up. But Poseidon's Kingdom is definitely one that was very strange and still fun for a while, but I just, it, it was too gimmicky. It was a bit too much. Yeah, I can't think of anything on my... Uh... Uh, my list is somehow... My... Okay, so next would be Tower of Madness which is kerplunk with marbles that's Cthulhu and you're trying not to go insane and you're pulling out tentacles. And while the tentacles are just graphics because they're just kerplunk on the inside. And the problem with that one was that the fun part of the game is to pull out the marbles and then see if you go insane. Like that's what's fun. Well, tacked onto this was this Yahtzee like dice rolling game and a point scoring system based on what you rolled on the dice, and you only actually pulled things when you failed. So when you played well and won and played tactically, you no longer had got to do the fun thing, which just, it was just, poor, to me, poor design. Like, like there should have been, like, I don't know, like you wanted to fail at some point. You're like, okay, I've won. I have the most points at this point. I'm just not going to slot my dice properly in purpose. I'm going to reroll so I fail just so I get to pull a thing and see if marbles fall. So that was another one. Um, Tragedy Looper is another because it's a, a versus game where you have one player being like the narrator in an anime mystery, generally murder. I think people die in all of them because that's why it's a tragedy. And you have the other players playing teenage investigators trying to figure out what the tragedy is. So you sit down, you play the game, 
and you have no idea what's happening. Like you can move around, you can talk to people, you can you can you can cheer people up, you can do some things, and eventually a tragedy happens, and you're like, oh, okay, that's what the tragedy is, and then it loops back to the beginning, and you play again. But now the characters know what the tragedy is, and they're trying to prevent it. And then they try to do the same thing. And if the tragedy happens, it loops back. And it just, it's such an interesting concept of the whole Groundhog Day style time travel. But it is super fiddly and hard to learn because the actions are weird. And you basically, it's a logic puzzle. So you need like a flow chart where you're keeping track of, okay, how many times did you cure up this person? Where did this person move? Okay, this person moved. They When, they, when you moved them here, no one died. So that must be a proper move. And like, it's just way too fiddly and weird. And, and trying to sell someone on this concept when it's not like a light, quick deduction game. Instead, it's this complicated token tracking, moving people on a board. And it's horrible to DM because if you screw something up, it can ruin the whole game. So that's another one. I'm um, trying to think of other weird games. Uh, 6.8 for Poseidon's Kingdom, by the way. 6 point? Isn't that not bad? That's, yeah, that's, not, that, bad. that's not terrible. Uh, a lot of people are saying it's too expensive. Would like all the... avoiding pulling a stick. See, the thing with that, it's not even a dexterity game. Yeah, it's kerplunk. Right. There's no dexterity. You just yep. pull a thing. There's literally no dexterity in that game. It's it's you're, You can't see the marbles. Like, you can't. There's no way to make a logical choice. Yeah, the thing with one of the big negatives about Poseidon's Kingdom is actually the price. They put the really nice components into it yeah, and said, jack the price up way too high for what the game what is. What it is, yeah. It's, it's a lighter kind of kid's game. That's exactly my thoughts on it. Although, interestingly, the weight is listed as 2.3 on board game. I, like I said, it's not a rolling move. Like, it's yeah. it's you have it's one of those you have multiple characters you control. So when, when you have to decide which ones to move, and you're also having to build up to fight this big boss at the end, like, it, it's not a kid's game. It just looks, I don't know, it, it's semi-gateway. I break it out, but it's terrible for audio. And we're also recording a podcast here. <laughs> Um, let me think. What else is weird? I'm, I'm looking. I'm hoping Deanna types something in the chat. I'm trying to think of weird games. Like Riff Raff is kind of weird because it's a wooden ship on a literal gimbal that you're stacking things on, and it's just the fact that it's like literally on a gimbal wandering around. Oh, there's a good one. See, I thought Deanna might help. Niagara. So here's a game that uses the box. You open it up. You flip the box over, and here you have the Niagara Falls. Right? And that's something nice and near dear to most of us. And on it, you put these like discs they're clear acrylic discs and you have a bunch of canoes and you put your canoes on and then your goal is to use your two canoes to go down the river as close to the falls edge as you can to mine gems and then get them back to base camp and the neat thing in this game is every round after you go you slide a new acrylic disc on and it causes all the other discs to slide down the falls and then at the end of the falls there's a branch a fork and you never know which way the discs are going to go and most of the time it goes this way, then this way, this way, then that way. And you can plan on that, but then every now and then you get two discs in a row. And if your canoe falls off to the end, you lose that canoe for so many times. And it's one of those games where it's everyone has perfect information where you have the numbers one through 10 and you watch what other people played to know which way they're going to go. So that one's a cool one. Deanna, Deanna's kicking butt here. Click Clack Lumberjack. It's a game where you put a bunch of tree trunks with bark on them and stack it up, and then you get this giant wooden axe. Like, it's not giant, giant, but like for a board game component, it's, you know, tall as a Barbie, plastic axe, and you try to tap it just enough for the bark to fall off without knocking it over. That's a pretty unique one. It's been uh, renamed and rethemed as Bling Bling Gemstone, which I don't get as much because now it's like a tower of gems and you're trying to spelunk it off. I don't know, Click Clack Lumberjack or TikTok Woodman. That's another, there's multiple names for this one. Unfortunately, it's been pirated like crazy, so you can find lots of fake versions. Indeed, yeah, we've. we've and I gotta say, go cuckoo, go cuckoo's pretty dang weird. Although I don't, I don't know if it's weird. I mean, it's essentially just a variant on pickup sticks. It's well, just yeah, pickup sticks, but in a, it together. In a, it's just in a, in, a, in the canister. Instead of dumping them out of the canister, you're you're playing in the you're playing in the canister. True, I guess. Uh, this would be a mo question. Does anyone remember a space game where you flick your ship to move and the board was a puzzle board? No, no, no. Uh, Deanna's talking about flip ships. She's thinking, but flip ships, you literally like flip tiddly winks trying to get them in a box. There's no flicking, it's different. Right. While you're flicking upward, like you actually put them on an edge and you flip it up. Right. And yes, they rethemed it Space Invaders because everyone's like, it's Space Invaders. And they're like, well, let's get the license and really release it. And actually, it looks mm -hmm. really good. Um, flick your ship to move, and the board was a puzzle board. No, I do not. <laughs> um, all I can think of in that point is Space Cadets. Um, 
that's the only one I can think of in it. But like the, the flicking was only for the cannons. I don't remember one where you flick your ships. I just keep thinking like there's got to. That's why I kind of want to do. I might do this one as a topic at some point because it definitely seems like a a topic where there's some good ones out there we're missing. Like I'm just not thinking. Although I don't think we we I don't think we found anything yet that's too weird to be fun. Um, uh, what was the first one I mentioned? Now I'm drawing a blank. Yeah, we're we're. This is why we're having an AMA tonight. <laughs> Um, so another one is Primordial Soup. Just because it's unique, you are playing Paramecium in a Primordial Soup, eating each other's poop. And when you eat a Paramecium, you poop out two poops of your color, and then other people eat that, and you slowly evolve your Paramecium to have, like, tentacles or, or flagellum so they can move more. And the tide changes in the Primordial Soup, which causes everyone to move around, and actually is one of the best games I've ever played. But, like, weird concept like like and it, and it's done very abstract but yes it's it's the poop eating game as many people call it and so ryan ryan actually answered his own question it's ascending empires from 2011 oh, you know what i never had that one but charles frank flick, another local game your way to galactic domination yeah charles frank owned a copy of that but he the boards is one of the fold-out boards so it's terrible for flicking and that's why i think the game didn't last so what he did is he actually made his own board well, it's not a fold-out board. It's, it's, they're puzzles. They're actual little or, puzzle, yeah, but the, puzzle pieces, but they, they have don't the fit edges. Flush. Yeah, right. they don't fit flush. I'm sorry. Again, I didn't own it. But I know he went and made, like, he went and got a four-by-four four piece of plywood and sanded it down, and, like, the planets are inset a bit, and you have to, like, flick and not let, hit the planet but land near it to show your ships there. I always wanted to try that game. It's, it's interesting because uh, the people are, like, in the, in the I'm looking at some of the photos, and they're like, no, it's not flat. That's part of the game. Again, it's it's one of those things well, where the texture is, is part it, of it. it, it wow. He wanted it fair. But <laughs> uh, so it's actually rated a 7.2 with 2,000 yeah. ratings. This it's is a solid game. Yep. No, I agree. That is supposed to be good. Yeah, planets were just set in the board. Yes, when he said a maze, I totally... <laughs> oh, puzzle board. See, puzzle board, I was thinking puzzle board like you're flicking around a puzzle. Nope, but actual puzzle. Which PC. now I want a game where you flick around the puzzle, like labyrinth <laughs> without the, you know, the wooden labyrinth, but instead right. you're flicking. That's what I was totally picturing in my head, which is something different. I swear there's other weird, like, I swear I could go downstairs and be like, wow, that's odd. Like, we have a game called Poo, where you're playing monkeys flinging poop at each other. But I don't know, but it was too weird to be fun. It was just a dumb theme. And, the, and you had D20 health that you, we used to use D20. So you had 20 health and there was no way to track it. So we used D20s. Right. And it was fun in that way that Munchkin's fun. No, we, I think we got rid of Poo. I don't know. We might still have it. <laughs> But I, I'm sure there's some. Yeah, I don't. Right. I I can't think of anything really that counts to me as weird. Like the just the, <laughs> the tragedy looper is probably the weirdest that I can think of. Although you've been recommending that, so I, <laughs> I again, it's got a learning curve. If you yeah. can get past that learning curve, worth playing. There you go. I always I always recommend that one with a caveat. It only ends up on a, a few specific lists. Like there aren't that many time travel games, or I don't own that many mystery games. Right. Yeah, dexterity games seem to get somewhat strange. Throw throw burritos weird. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you're throwing something at each. Well, and there's yeah, that hex hex. There's that one with the uh the the cavemen clubs. Um. Oh, architect. Architect. There, architect's pretty weird. That, I agree, but it's definitely not too weird. Yeah. So architect is a game where it's a cooperative game where you're telling your teammates how to build a structure, and you have a picture of it, and they don't, and it's a bunch of wooden blocks. The thing is, you can't speak English, and you have a whole list of moves, like whatever. Gunga means to the left, and, and Unda means stack it and whatever. And you get a big club, and anytime someone does something wrong, you bat them on the head to say they made the wrong move. And while they redid that as poetry for Neanderthals, I think. Uh, so, yeah, that one's pretty strange. I, yeah, that fits. is pretty strange. Um, Hex Hex is a, a hot potato with magic spells. It gets ridiculous, like once you have all the expansions and stuff in, and like it has elements where you have the um, was it spoons or whatever? You have stuff in the center of the table, and everyone has to grab one. And what it is is there's like three white things to grab and two black things, and someone gets stuck with none, and you never know which are actually good. You never know what you should grab. Like in general, whites are usually good, but there's some cards where they're bad. And you're trying to damage the other players by passing around a magic spell. And the basic game is kind of boring, but it's kind of like playing flux. Where like it starts off, you're just passing the thing and it gets stuck with someone that takes some damage. But then there's ways to like duplicate the spell, and sometimes you have 20 spells flying around the table. It can be fun, 
I ended up getting rid of it because it started actual fist fights at public play events. So <laughs> just people just took it too seriously. Um, uh, all right. Uh this is a little quick one. I think we covered a lot of this, but what do you what do your kids think of HeroQuest? Ryan's asking. Oh, my kids love it so far. We we honestly haven't done much with it, unfortunately. We haven't been able to sit down and get together too often. Um, the biggest indicator to me was they lost and and fairly badly and and still want to play. So always a good sign. Especially Gwen is all about winning. Uh, her her winning a game greatly influences her, <laughs> her like of a game, unfortunately. And she's usually willing to give things a second try, but it and now it's pretty much at the point where if she loses, she's willing to try again, but if she wins, she just likes the game. Right. Whereas the youngest doesn't care. The youngest goes in expecting to lose. So she doesn't get that upset by it. But yeah, they really enjoyed it. Um, I have a feeling they're going to want more character progression that's in the game because they're very much about name their characters, draw the picture of their characters, and and build your character. And there's really not a lot of that in Hero Quest. True. I still don't understand why they didn't make the first mission easier, but <laughs> along with other issues with that game. Yeah. Fair enough. Do they like the uh, the 3D props? Um, I, to be honest, it didn't stick out for them because I use 3D props all the time. True, like, that's like, right. It's not all that all that. It's, it's not all that novel to them <laughs> because when we play games, I tend to throw out 3D props. Like I have bowls full of 3D props for when I run D and D or or I play Gloomhaven or anything like that. So so it wasn't that weird. They do like the miniatures. I don't know. Uh, they were happy they could do an all female party. So that's a thumbs up for the um, mythic tier backing and getting the alternate heroes. They were happy about that. They, they actually really liked the fact they have an all woman party. Excellent. They keep telling me I have to share more pictures online to upset people. <laughs> all right. Uh, moving on. Uh, Jeff's got a question here. Now, this one's funny because I have this on our list of questions. Oh, so, so he's asked this before. Are we going to argue? Are we gonna... Do so you we can? Yeah. Do you own and keep games that you do not like just because they are important milestones in the history of board games, and you might want to introduce someone to that historical contract context. I know I do, says Jeff. I, a very little amount, much less nowadays. I was more worried about it before. Um, especially, like, the, the big thing is when I run public play events. So if I run public play events, there are certain games that are great for introducing certain concepts. So Dominion is perfect for introducing someone to deck building. It is the best way to show someone the basics of deck building. Catan is still a really simple trading game that, and area control and teaches a lot of basic board game concepts that are used in almost every Euro game afterwards. Um, there's probably others. I'm drawing a blank. Dominion is the big one I know I still have. So I, I really should get rid of Intrigue. Like just keep Dominion. For some reason, I have both and I don't really feel I need both. Um, but in general, no. Um, what I have to keep are games that were milestones in my progression, which is why my shelf behind me is covered in Games Workshop games that I probably will never play again. Like I have dreams of sometime Sean will move down to Windsor and maybe we'll break <laughs> out some of these old games and see if they're still good. But in general, no, I I, I don't. I, most of the ones games I keep are, are nostalgia for me more so than, oh, this was a landmark. Or if it was a landmark, I still like it. Like, that's the other thing is, like, like I keep El Grande because it's, like, one of the most pure area majority games, but I want to play El Grande. Like, there's, there's no reason I wouldn't play it. If you get the right group down, and we'll sit down and play it. And, like, Shogun and Wallenstein, right? Like, I love that. Like, yeah, they're Cube Tower games, and they they, they established a, a, almost a brand of games for a while, but I still like the games, and I want to play them. So there aren't a lot that, um, like, we have a Scrabble board. I, I just kind of, it's old. And we have it. I don't remember the last time we used it. I guess we keep that for nostalgia's sake. So I'd never brought it out to events. So not really. Like, like I have a couple. Uh, Dominion's the best one because I'm not a big fan. Like, I, I don't see when I would play Dominion on our own, except to show it to be like I'd show Sean. I'm like, here, you like deck builders. This is what started it. Now you've seen it. Okay, let's go play a better deck builder. <laughs> I, I, no, I, I Star Realms... Like what I do did do for a long time is I would keep games I don't like to bring to public play events. That's like, a, but even like I, that's why I have a copy of Love Letter. Love Letter is an example of one I don't really enjoy. And Hanabi, that's another one. Hanabi and Love Letter are two I own just to have at events. And those are ones that I specifically like to bring out to drinking events. Those are the ones I want to bring out to like Villains Bistro, Easy Mode, where people, they're, they're, they're social games more so than tactical games. 
and I do not love love letters. So that love letter is a good example. Dominion's another, but it's not like I have a ton. I don't have a bunch of you know gateway games just for introducing people to board games anymore. Alrighty, excellent. I uh, hope that answers Jeff's question for him. Uh, next, we've got a question that came out of the Discord. Pax asks, what's a standout moment of delight at the way a new-to-you game played? Like something that made you laugh out loud because the game revealed itself to be so clever or elegant. Oh, it's just an AMA where I don't have to think so much on my feet. <laughs> <laughs> laugh aloud is hard um probably medium medium would be an example yes specifically medium sitting downstairs i think you were there for yep. the first game weren't yep. you sitting downstairs and i explained the rules and i passed the cards out and specifically picking up my hand and seeing the cards and realizing how those cards would interact was awesome like just like oh i get it now just seeing my first hand of card, i'm like oh i get it and then when we had the first, it went terribly, but the first actual trying to get a medium, which I think was Sean and D or it was Tori and D. I know D was involved. It was just, it was just me, you and D the first time. And it that was, was okay. Yeah. That was where so, that, and that was where D just kind of just, just blanked. locked up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she just couldn't say a word and we laughed and, and like we hadn't laughed that much since probably telestration some night at 3am. So yes, definitely. So that is 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 in a perfect example, I think, of that. Is is that game of median medium? It just clicked. Like like the two things, the two moments of looking at the cards, going, oh wow, they did a really good job at picking cards. And then the actual one, like people laughing out loud, like like falling off the chair laughing. Yeah. And like before that, and it, it, the first time I played Telestrations was like that. Going way back. Uh, yeah. playing Telestrations at 3 a.m. at extra life events has definitely done it. Um, I have another. to say for me now, this isn't a laugh out loud, but a, a sort of stand out moment of, of delight, I guess you could say was the first time we sat down and played the Minecraft game Yeah, build because we weren't expecting this to be a game. It, it was going to be, I, it, we were hoping it was going to be better than that trash uh, Minecraft card game. I, my kids <laughs> got, Yes, but I was honestly not expecting the depth of gameplay in that and when we sat down and realized oh wait this is wow there's a there's a game here yeah, there's a um, real game here it and and you know the way they use their cu the cube you've got the 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 cube of cubes the the one thing that really makes it feel minecraft yeah yeah absolutely you're chipping away at this giant cube of cubes uh i really shocked me uh cuz i i was completely not expecting them to have made a game game so I wasn't as shocked by it, but yeah, it was definitely a, a surprising game. Well, and I think one of the things that holds you back a little bit from the the, the delight is the combination of, uh, you know, the depth of research you do before you even look at a game, well, but yeah. also, but also the unboxing videos. Uh, you're, I've you're, already seen. You're, you're, yeah. There's so much sort of ramp up to when you get that game at the table. It's pretty hard to hit that level. Yeah, it's true to be surprised. Uh, where's another one? Well, I mean, probably I, I would say probably Gokuku is would so, would be something that. Oh uh, yeah, so so that's a perfect example, right? So here I am. I'm at at Origins Games Fair, and then there's Wayne Humphrey, the Star Wars guy, who's actually one of our patrons. So thanks, Wayne. Isn't he? Maybe not. Was well, uh, I think he still is. Is Does he, he still? I don't remember <laughs> saying his name. That's why I'm like, I don't think we have him on the list. I'm pretty sure he's still a patron. Wow, Wayne, sorry. <laughs> anyway, I know he doesn't tend to actually listen to podcasts. He's just an old friend from G+, who I've actually... He is the person I hang out with at Origins. He works uh, works the White Wizard Games booth every year. And every year, he has shown up with something that is like some dumb party game that ends up being awesome. Right. And the first year is one I still don't own. I can't bring myself to buy it. It was Cheeky Monkey. And he was walking around the Origin Games Hall the entire time with this stuffed monkey under his arm and you have to reach in the monkey's butt and pull out chips. And it's literally, it's a bag builder and the bag happens to be a monkey. So he definitely got me, got me into that one. Right. But I'm like, I don't know. I can't buy the monkey butt game. It was a little too late. For me. <laughs> but then the next year it was, it was the mind. He was the first person I ever heard go nuts over the mind. Sorry, go bonkers over the mind. And well, everyone knows how much that exploded for a few years there. 
Now it's not quite the deal it was at the time, but at the time he was the one that knew it. And he's like, you got to get to the Pandasaurus booth. As soon as it opens, you got to get there. They're going to sell out. And I tried and they sold out, but I did get to play it and it blew me away on the mind. I'll admit, I still don't actually own a copy of the mind. Do it. No, we bought the mind. We do have the mind. I, I don't think I got it that weekend. Well, the last origins we went to in 2019, he's like, Mo, you got to play this game. Go cuckoo. You got to go to the Haba booth and you got to play this game. And it's like reverse pickup sticks. Oh my God. It's amazing. And I'm like the Haba booth, like Haba makes kids games. Like, but they make animal upon animal. Like, like they, they, they do some good ones, but I'm like, he's like, no, 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 go try it. So I had a meeting with T from Haba already set up. So when we get there, she's trying to show me these Euro games. They had a new line of games which I think they called Game Night Games. I totally forget now. They weren't yellow boxes. Uh, King of the Dice was one. Like, they're, they're still simple games, but they're not kids' games. So she's trying to show me these, and I'm like, can I see Go Cuckoo? She's like, you want to see Go Cuckoo? I'm like, yeah, I want to see Go Cuckoo. She's like, you know that was like a limited release for Easter, right? And I'm like, Easter's not even coming up. I'm like, yeah, but I heard this is really good. She's like, okay. And then she leads me over. They lead me over and show me Go Cuckoo. And, and I'm like, oh, that actually looks pretty neat. I, I want to take a copy, and I bought it. Like, I didn't even... This wasn't even a review copy uh, of Go Cuckoo. So I, so I grabbed Go Cuckoo and then I did make a deal with them to get some review things as well. But that's the part's not important. And then I take it and we go, I don't remember where, we probably went back to home base because this is at this time I was hanging out with Ms. Breck and Mark people. And we played it and we're like, oh, this is brilliant. And <laughs> I don't know how many times we played over the weekend or how many people we played with, but that game got played at every social gathering I was at. We go to Barley's for drinks. I brought Go Cuckoo. We went to the Three Ponies for Shepherd's Pie. I brought Go Cuckoo. I went to an RPG. I brought it. And if the game ended early, I put Go Cuckoo on the table after playing Hydro Hackers and we played Go Cuckoo. So yeah, Go Cuckoo is a great one. Yeah, it's weird. Whatever they whatever they came out with, they don't seem to they seem to have killed that that branding already because I'm not seeing I think it was game night games. Like it, it's, it was on the box. I'd have to look at the, the box for King of the Dice. Um, Karuba was in that line, which yeah, you would need. They're right? non-yellow. They're definitely non-yellow. Yeah, they're but... non-yellow, and I think they were called Game Night Games, and it might have been inside the box. Uh, Terrible typing. Game sounds. Night approved. Because uh, there's have a family games, but those are a mix of yellow and other. Oh, uh, uh, nice. I know it's terrible. I usually say I won't Google <laughs> while we're while we're doing this. I want the back of the box. Anyone have a picture of the back of the box there? Does it say anything? Oh, it's not in English. Which makes sense because obviously. I think it was inside, whatever. Anyway, they launched a, a new we're we're not just kids games brand, which made right. sense. Yeah, no, time. absolutely. I can't find what I think it was game night. All right, I saw lots in the chat. I don't know if we saw anything important there. Not necessarily questions. But uh, like a lot of people stuff. talking about uh, so a lot going back to those uh, you know classic games. Yeah. Talking about uh, Catan, Kark, Citadel, Puerto Rico. Um, okay, so Citadels I sold. Puerto Rico I still play. Kark's one. I, I like Kark though. Again, like like I, I'm not keeping it just because it's a good gateway game. But I'll admit it's been a long time since I played Kark, and I probably would only break it out with new people. Personally, I prefer Isle of Sky. But Deanna doesn't like Isle of Sky. Like, I think Isle of Sky kills Kark completely. Almost Jones theories it out of for, for experienced gamers. See, where Kark's definitely... If, and, and why would I play Kark now with new gamers when I have Lamb versus Sea? See, and if like, I'm going to play Kark, I want to play the digital online. Like, the Steam version of Kark yeah. is really, really good. Like, mm -hmm. it's I have, a, I have a hard time wanting to to bother with the, the setup of Kark when I know that there's a way better version yeah. sitting there on the computer. I used to play a lot of Kark on the Xbox, and it was pretty good on the Xbox. Yeah, Kark, Kark, I think I still have two copies downstairs, one that's got all my expansions in and one that's just the base game that I got off someone at some point because they didn't want it. So now Ryan doesn't join us on Sundays, and he's asking us about Kickstarters. Are we, are we going to cover any of that, or are we going to say I sorry, We can Ryan? talk a bit about Kickstarters because <laughs> we're not going to do a lobby, so we can do that. Sure. So here's the Might and Magic 3 reward game to crowdfund late this year. Any thoughts? And we do have thoughts. We actually went into detail on this on Sunday. But yeah, it's what they've done is they've taken the art and that feel and they've really sort of given you a lot of that inspiration. But we are pretty sure that they aren't going to capture the awesome combat system yes. of Heroes and Might and Magic 3 which is a huge drawback. 
because like, like that's the whole point, right? You go around <laughs> and you collect new troops and you upgrade and you do all that, like to win the battles to eventually take over the temple. I don't know that the company that's doing it does not have a track record. They don't have any, like they have designers who have designed things, but nothing, no, no big hits. Yeah. I, I am extremely skeptical of it. Like yeah. extremely. I think skeptical. it's going to look great. And I think it's going to give you feels looking at it, but I think it's going to suffer some as a game. <laughs> so Jeff finds it odd. I call carcass on Kark, but I, I don't, I've probably been doing that since like 2002 or so. Yeah. I've, I've, that's just what I've always called it. Probably because of you, maybe, I don't know. Probably. I'm, I've now called Catan Catan for years. That was always settlers, 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 because that's what it says on my box. Right. They Before totally the branding, that part of it. And I'm like, I don't even understand why they decided everyone calls it Catan because everyone I know calls it settlers. Some people called it farm, farm the game, which oh, also yeah. I think fits. But yeah, absolutely. Or Casson. All right. I call it the song. <laughs> play the song. That tile laying game. No, honestly. I, I more so should probably get rid of it because Land versus Sea is a way better gateway tile laying game. Oh, absolutely. Nowadays. The one I love is Carcassonne the City, but no one even owns that one. I, is it the city? The castle. I like both, actually. Carcassonne the City is the one that's designed by Rainier Nitzia and there's two player only. Right. That one's okay. I, I, it's good, but it takes up too much space. But the original, the other one, Carcassonne, the castle, I love where you actually have wooden walls you're building. And you put guards on the walls and they score based on what they can see. That is actually my favorite version of Carcassonne. Yeah, mm -hmm. the one in the wooden box is the is the city. Carcassonne, the city. Um, we also own Heart Hunters and Gatherers, which is better than the original as well. Though I prefer the original with the expansions I own, which is Inns and Cathedrals and Traders and Barbarians. Mm -hmm. I own more than that, but those are the two I always use. Right. So there, we've answered the question of what, how do you play Carcassonne? <laughs> uh, That's the one I wonder, I wonder, uh, you have all those online? Like the Steam, can you get traders and builders? I and... believe you can. I have not uh, done all the things that I almost never play it. So right. I haven't, uh, um, I haven't bought all the upgrades, but I know there's a ton of different uh, upgrades you can get for it. So um, they, they don't, uh, they don't short you on DLC. <laughs> Of course not. Uh, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here to one that PAX had in the Discord. And uh, so they've been binging video game speed runs recently. And this actually okay. is, is, is a little bit, of, uh, I'm going to reference the, the chat room here as well. So their question is, are there any board games where you could see a way to use a quirk of the rules or mechanics, a glitch, if you will, to take a different path to the end game than the designers intended or anticipated and I, and I jumped this one into the into the into the queue a little early because we've had people talking about puerto rico in the chat room and as as frustrates many people there are ways to play puerto rico that yeah. uh have ideal solutions that i don't think well, the i don't think were ever actually in, anticipated or intended by the designer because they are game breaking See, I'm not sure about that. It's it's not like that in, in, in Puerto Rico. The problem with Puerto Rico is there's a scripted opening. So it's more like there are set openings in chess and certain ones you play and certain you don't. Puerto Rico has a scripted start, which isn't a glitch. It's just there is a method that's better than other methods. And while if you don't, if you have anyone at the table who doesn't follow the script, it screws over the person on your left or right. I forget which. And while people get really upset because you stepped away from it, which personally, I think now you just made the game interesting because now we like if it really was that scripted start at turn six, like just do the thing like you get it, you get you get a. I know corn's part of it. You get a corn, you get an ink, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. Now it's play if that's literally the problem. But the thing is, people can mess with it. But if you watch like a tournament, everyone's going to open the same. It's it's like it is the opener, which, again, I don't think it's really an exploit. It may have even been intended by the designer that there is a way that, you know, someone's got to grab corn. Someone should grab this. Someone should grab this. Someone should grab this. So that all these things are in play and these buildings are in play at the beginning. But again, that's bad design. Modern design would be give everyone that stuff to start. Then. So I, I don't see it as a glitch. Yeah, I it Maybe bad does it game design? I don't know. I just, again, you're right. It should just jump to the sixth turn yes. with everyone having if all that stuff. If that is actually the case, to me that that does seem as uh, unintended uh, or or 
I don't know if it's unintended or just bad design. One of the two, yeah. I suppose. Um, I honestly don't know the difference. And all you got to do is use the expansion and that's gone. Because right. that randomizes what buildings are in play and then you never have the script. Like it's it's been fixed by the designer by putting out the, the buildings, which now come with the base game. So there you go. All that's right, well, definitely part of it. Going back to that question, are there any board games where you could see a way to use a quirk of the rules or mechanics, a glitch to take a different path to the end game? I'm thinking there probably are, but I'm not thinking of any. Now, where I have had this happen is in escape room games. Mm -hmm. I have played escape room games where I got the solution and it wasn't the way they intended you to. And I'm like, I got it right. And I'm like, but I did it right. And then I like look at the clues and I'm like, oh, that's how we were supposed to get there. Okay. Well, that's not how we did it. Or, or something like that. Um, and I can't think of a very specific example, but I know that's happened a couple times, like not even just once. Um, or also in, in, in that type of game where we solved something ahead of time. And it was frustrating because there was no way to like input that, but we'd already figured it out. Um. I'm, I'm trying to think of like pitch cars is the one I think of where there's like, if you skip the track a certain way, like there's, right. there's rules for how many track sections. And if you played a lot of pitch car and you know that rule, you can look at certain layouts and be like, Oh, instead of going around the track, yeah, if jump. I do this, but then you're only allowed to skip certain sections. Yeah. Cause you can only skip three sections. I think it's it is, two right? or three or yeah, something. Yeah. I, I don't remember the exact rule. Same with like, you're not supposed to like, if you bang into someone else's car and knock them off, they get put back. You can do some things to kind of bend the rules where you use someone else's card and you want to get reset. So you purposely do this, which is not in the spirit of the rules because it's supposed to be a race. Right. Well, and I think Jeff's asking, you know, how to use a glitch that isn't cheating. But I think the question is whether or not that glitch has been, you know, has been closed or not. Right. If there's an FAQ somewhere that, that answers the question, but I, you know, rule books have, you know, sometimes not fully, fully answered. They haven't, the the designers and and playtesters haven't fully found all the different games. I mean, look at Magic: The Gathering, right? You know, they, they need oh. to come up with a billion new rules every. There you uh, go. Magic is probably release. an example of of uh, lots of glitches people have found and exploited. Right. I, those they then they come out and eventually the game fixes them. But there are glitches that happen because you just can't account for all the possible combinations. And you've got some really smart people out there who can go, Oh, well, if I do this, 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 and this, all of a sudden you're instantly dead, you know, yeah. <laughs> and that sort of thing. Another one is, um, uh, Warhammer 40 K there's a meme out there and I couldn't tell you exactly how it worked, but there was some person who was winning all the tournaments but using some weird rule exploit about holding his entire army in reserve. Mm. And then someone else showed up and then did a thing where he started with his whatever on the opposite side of the board. So the other guy could never deploy his troops. So he won. Yeah, and no, the, I, the I actually, I like even remember that because like, you told me about book. that once and I, and I ended up researching it and I'm like, yeah, yeah it was yeah, fascinating. Was, it was really interesting what he had done. Um, and it was, it was again, just, it's someone was abusing the rules and then someone better abused it, which yeah, yeah. I just, it was very much a schadenfreude moment <laughs> that I thought was really good. Absolutely. Um, war games definitely used to happen. Um, I know people cheat, but that's not necessarily a glitch. Um, yeah, it's, it's really, you need to look for those, those gaps. Like an in the exploit. Rules. Yeah. It's, it's the gaps in the rules that haven't been covered uh and and the thing is with board games though is the rules are i forget the two words i'm, I'm gonna forget the rules words the, one of the big things that separates the board games from role-playing games is whatever the, the rules and board games are definitive or whatever right in a role-playing game or in a board game you can only do what the rules tell you can do whereas in a role-playing game it's what you can't do that the rules tell you and again i forget the terms for that yeah so even in board games like like the the exploits that some people are going to call exploits oh it's not the rules i can do this goes along with the well it doesn't say i can't punch you you know so uh, that's okay to do it and, and most board gamers won't accept that like the, the the table culture doesn't allow for people to pull in things that aren't in the book yep so it's 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 hard to get those type of video game glitches right like the, those short, shortcuts um some examples there's infinite points uh, Star Realms. Star Realms, there are quite a few combos that are hard to do it where you get you could get infinite points. And I pulled it off once where it just has to do with thinning your deck so you keep cycling your deck because you're trashing a card to get points. And then you resuffle your deck so you get to pick it back up and do it again type of thing. Dominion, there was a way to do that with a certain thing where you just never run out of actions. And there was a way to shuffle your deck. 
Uh, someone was mentioning uh, Chapel Plus Lab at Dominion. Yeah, so maybe that's it. I don't remember. Um, but that, that's uh, what I said. I know there was a Dominion one. I was actually reading the chat to know Dominion got pulled up. Deck builders. Deck builders tend to have, like I said, not exploits, but certain card combinations that are ridiculously powerful if you're able to get them. I, there was there's one in Clank where you can get infinite like you can get all your cubes clanked out. Right. Uh, yeah. No. There's uh, there's definitely some stuff out there. I think what and a lot of it is uh, how rules are read. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and getting into the grammar arguments, I um, we yes. uh, I think it was uh, Draconis where we had there were a couple of things where it's like okay there is no FAQ so we need to now analyze the grammar in the wording to see yes what the yeah, are there any term other is. cards that say yeah you know I I can't remember what it was but yeah there was one in Draconis card game anything where you're throwing in that many variables right like card games every card impact impacts over there Magic the Gathering every CCG every every one of those um yeah. that's where you see it but like i can't think of like shogun if there's some exploit about if you hold on to your cubes instead of putting them in the tower you can do it or something i, I guess the the risk australia thing would be an example of turtling in australia and risk is probably an exploit where it's it's against the the theme of the game but it works yep yeah and they're talking about people are talking about uh rules and abilities and, and grammar in uh in, in rules may versus must yes um, and may it's interesting versus... i've actually gotten into this recently one of the th one of the things i'm doing in my job right now is i'm writing a glossary of terms and a lot of these terms that we come up with you know in my job are from the construction industry and right. one thing you learn in the construction industry is define 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 so if you've got a spec and the word furnish is in the spec or provide there will be definitions in there uh even even though there are standard definitions for those in the industry they will be defined mm -hmm. in that document um and, and things like that because the difference is you know massive whether or not you, you know whether or not you're you're including a fifty thousand dollar labor budget or just shipping some product <laughs> Yeah, the May versus Must one's huge because I worked in quality for a number of years and with ISO certifications. May and Must are huge, and people don't understand the difference. Yeah. You must have the following eight documented procedures. Your documented procedures may be kept, you know, and yep. it totally mattered. Oh, absolutely. The, or sorry, the, the, the more ISO one is, sorry, you must have eight procedures for these eight things. These may be documented. Right. means they can be verbal. Yep. which is something a lot of people forget and they over document. I'm like, why are you writing all this down? That's all stuff you can just get audited for and get in trouble for. Don't even write it down. As long as everyone can answer the question when you say, what is your process for this? You're good. That's right. how you pass ISO audits. <laughs> Make sure you don't write down anything you can actually get wrong. There we go. And if you want to hire me as a consultant for ISO auditing, I could use a, 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 a part-time job. So <laughs> tell you how to get through with zero nonconformances every time. So uh, D has brought up uh, privately that we're not going to talk about tonight, but I'll give you a preview of what's going to be coming up on Sunday. Okay. So uh, after our copyright and uh, legal episode that we did a little while back, uh, a large case has come is coming up in front of the Supreme Court that's actually involving the game of life. Uh, and it has some interesting... Um, outcomes depending on on how the justices rule uh they have taken on the case so there will be a ruling it's just a matter of which way they go but uh it's got some interesting long uh so interesting uh outcomes for content pre-1978 okay so we'll we'll be talking about that a little bit on sunday uh when we chat and deanna wanted to talk about um Playing games of vision impaired, which is a topic Ryan would probably be interested in. Absolutely. Yeah, although I know Sunday. Ryan can't it's often make it on there on Sundays. Yeah, so. on Sunday. All right. I think we should fire off Dave's questions and then put them back in the piles for the next time we have an AM. And then I think we'll wrap it up because it's almost 10 30. All right. I don't know if you have a if if the people in the chat, last chance. We're we're gonna go <laughs> hammer off these three quick questions and then um, which may not be that quick once I start thinking about them. Because again, I just kind of <laughs> looked at what they were. I, I vaguely looked at them and went, yeah, okay, what's game of the year? And I don't have an answer at this point. 
Um, <clears throat> and so if anyone has a question, get it in now, if you wish. Um, though I think you might want to throw this one in just because it is someone in the chat. Sure. See, it's it's basically there. I even copied Jeff's question there. <laughs> he just I didn't even realize that's the one I copied apparent, from the apparently notes. We and, haven't uh Yeah, I told you. I'm like, that's like the same question he asked. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, funny. Yeah. See, it shows how much we read our show notes. I had copied Jeff's previous question in here as an if needed, if no one in the chat speaking up, and it was he basically said, Do you keep any board games because of their historical relevance? Jeff really wanted to know. Yes, I guess he did. <laughs> All That's right, well, so Dave, I think we should cover this, but let's do Dave's. Yeah, Dave Dave asked us in the Discord today. So with all these monthly AMAs, it might be fun to track some things. So first off, what game did you play the most of the past month? Past month, so we're talking January? Uh, I assume yeah, at I think, this point. Yeah, we're, we're still early enough in February. And, and honestly, I'm going to look this up. I am going to say off the top of my head, Maybe Azul? Azul on Board Game Arena is going to be my guess. Possibly it's something like Aqualand, too, or something else D and I hammered off a bunch of games one night. <laughs> All right, let's look. Bod plays. Played 34 games in January. Wow, number one is Lost Ruins of Jesus. Killing all our lights. <laughs> Ruining the show. All right, Lost Ruins of Arnak. What are you doing? All right, apologies. This goes on YouTube. You're swearing. We got to, we got to, you might have to ding that. I didn't even hear her. He spoke out loud. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, Lost Ruins of Arnak at four plays was my most played game of last month. Next was Aqualin, then the game. Then Azul, so I was I was in the top five, and then Chronicles of Avel. All right, well here we go. Uh, I I have to say mine is it's not, not going to be an Arnac. Um, I think Azul might be one, although we haven't actually. I think I've actually finished more. We haven't finished as many. We finished as I more we games finished. of Tapestry than we have of Azul. <laughs> no, I got two of each actually. Oh, okay. Oh, I should. I, yeah, I said they're in order, but you know what? I have a whole bunch that are two. The Chronicles of Evul, Doodle Dungeon, Star Wars Unlocked, Tapestry, and WWE Superstar Showdown are actually all tied. Uh, so it looks like actually Sushi Go is my my uh, boast from the last, which isn't a big shock. Uh, so uh, next up, what games are currently in the lead for Game of the Year? I mean, I know what D's going to say. So what you... uh, No, same thing. Arnak so yeah. far. Like uh, for us, it, it was new to me this year. Yep. Arnak definitely wins. Uh, being able to play it online has been awesome. Definitely enjoying Arnak. Uh, I don't think anything else has come close, to be honest. And I think that that answers our next question, too, which is the best new-to-you game you tried in the last month. Uh, yeah. All right, fair well, enough. Well, no, because, well, if it's new, when did I play Arnak first? Did I play it? Oh, yeah, because I got it for Christmas. Yeah. So, yes, just because it's January. I'm like, if, if we <laughs> go into this month, then maybe not. Yeah, so Arnak for both of us. So what I'm thinking is we can do this every time we have an AMA. We'll yeah. try to remember to throw these in. So yeah, game of the year. Now, if I had to do a 2022 game, I don't think I played any. Yeah, and I think Chronicles I have of Avel. Say... There you go. Chronicles of Avel. Nope, that's 2021. And I have, mm. I have to say for me, Arnak is definitely in the lead for game of the year for me as well, uh, even though I haven't played it physically and I, I really need to. Um... Yeah, it would probably help. Yeah, I have not. I'm looking to see if I've even played a 2022 game. I have not. Or oh yeah, it should be going 2021, probably because like 2022, it's been a month. Yeah, there's almost no games haven't. that have come out yet in 2022. Yeah, there's almost no games that have come out. Those, so those will all start be... coming out in March, most likely. Yeah. So best game of 2021 that I played is Arnak 2021. No, it's 2020. Yep. So it's it's looking like Chronicles of Avel is the best 2021 game I've played so far. Which might be the only 2021 <laughs> game I end up playing. I think Disney Sidekicks was in there. Yeah, but that's not that's nope. not winning anything. Nope, no, it's not. Uh, Dune Imperium. No, 2020 for Dune Imperium. It's older than I thought. Well, yeah, it's the same. Came out the same time as Arnak. So 2020 for both of them. Yeah, it makes sense. They were like the same week. That's right. Oh, Arnak's up to the number three in family games. Who the hell calls that a family game? That's weird. I, I yeah, I wouldn't call that a family. I game. I wouldn't rate that as a family game. 
strange. It's number 31 in strategy, but how is that a family game? Yeah, I don't know. The, the, that type family strategy. Can we edit that for people? <laughs> how do you vote on this? It's a poll, I guess. Fun for kids and adults. 74 people have voted it fun for kids and adults. Strange. Yeah, I don't. Thematic game, none. I put it thematic over family. So it's not an emphasis on narrative. All right. Well, I have voted. We'll see. All right. <laughs> that changes things. No, that's not a family weight anything. Oh, that was something we found out. So, because uh, we're not doing a lobby, because it seems silly to do a lobby after this, is um, my package from the op was returned to them. Oh. That's so I probably should save that for, for the coffee break. I closed the notes somewhere, trying to find them. <laughs> See where we're at. So our last question you wanted to cover from Ryan yeah, yeah. is, what is a game you have culled from your collection you never intended to, and why? All right, I think we talked about this, but Anachrony. So I back the Anachrony Fractures of Time Infinity Box which was a new printing of Anachrony in a bigger box with box inserts and a brand new expansion that didn't exist before that would fit all the existing expansions I already owned. And I backed it at some point and then later was like, oh, you know, we don't have a lot of money right now. And I just backed this $80 Kickstarter or something. I'm like, yeah, I am reselling games. And what happened was I listed some games for sale on Facebook and someone was like, what other games do you have? So I started just taking pictures and I was like, here's all of them. And I listed, showed them pictures, like 80 games. And they're like, they took eight of them and I sold them anachrony. So then months later, maybe even a year later, it was a long time. Whenever the Kickstarter delivered, it shows up on my porch and it was in here for a long time. And I'm like, it's in here, but I'm going to save it for an end of the episode unboxing. So it sat here for probably another couple of weeks. And then I open it up and it says upgrade pack. And I'm like, oh, shoot. And I went on Kickstarter and I looked and sure enough, I did not back at the get all the stuff level. Instead, I backed at the upgrade level and I no longer had the base game. So thankfully, I contacted the person that bought all these games off me and said, hey, I screwed up. And they went, oh, that's cool because we didn't like Anachrony, which I'm like, what? You didn't like Anachrony, <laughs> but whatever. And they sold the bat to me for the exact same price they bought it off me. So no loss, no harm, no foul. But man, I messed up. Like, like, <laughs> And then trying to get a copy of Anachrony at that point was going to be terrible. Oh, yeah. Like it, it, it was, and as Deanna pointed out, when I first got it, I, I'm like, did they not ship me what I backed at? Because I swore I backed at the full level. Like I totally had convinced myself the whole game was coming. So that is, that is the one big example of when I sold something I shouldn't have. All right. And the follow up to that question is, what game do you keep trying to call from your collection, but just can't seem to find a new home for and won't just throw away? All right. So there's a few um big trouble in little china the deck building game legendary big trouble in little china no one seems to want it even though i, I thought it was okay for a legendary game i just don't like legendary games um next would be battleship galaxies which was awesome but needed an expansion it was a it hasbro worked with avalon hill to put out a new good version of battleship set in space with like fleet battles and all this stuff and it's really solid but it comes with two armies that were meant to be expandable and they were never expanded and they never put out the other armies. And while well, it ends up being just the same battle over and over again, which is still more interesting than battleship, but like I played that battle five, six, 12 times or something like that. So that one, no one seems to want it because I think they just see battleship and are like, I'm not paying $30 or more for battleship. Um, and then there is a flicking game called bicycle, but it's spelled weird because it's not in English. I don't remember exactly how it's spelled and it's pitch car but with something called the Z-Ball. And it's a proprietary ball that has little ball bearings inside it. So unlike Pitch Car, where you're just flicking your crokinole disc, you can actually like put English and backspin on it. And it'll actually stop on a slope because of the small marbles or whatever inside it. And it's a bicycle racing game. And it works like Pitch Car, but the thing is you have your bike and you put the bulb in front of your wheel, then you flick it, and then you put your miniature back. And it uses ramps. It's like, it's like advanced Pitch Car but it's just so hard. Like the Z ball takes actual skill to be able to flick. And unless you have a group that plays it all the time together and gets good at it, you bring it out to a public play event and people just like can't get it up the first ramp or it just keeps rolling back or flicking it halfway across the room. 
So I finally decided to get rid of it. And I paid a ridiculous amount of money for this one because it's not available in North America. And a whole bunch of people on Board Game Geek at the time were like, oh, it's so much better than Pitch Car and you can get so much better. And like you go on YouTube and watch people use the Z-Ball. It's really impressive. Um, and it's it's a there's another version called Roadsters, which is even more so Pitch Car because it's race cars. So that it's down here. If anyone's interested in bicycle, um, it's all plastic and snap together, not wood. It looks like electric race car track. I don't know. And no one seems to want that. <laughs> Those are the ones I can think of. And then Deanna just pointed out one we shouldn't have gotten rid of, but we intentionally did. And that is Android, which we talked about when we were talking about mystery games. So that yeah. last episode, two episodes ago, yeah. when we talked about mystery games, Android, which is the Philip K. Dick board game, which is you are basically playing Blade Runner. And it, I, I don't know. I, I was so frustrated with a couple plays of it that I got rid of it. And the people I gamed with at the time hated it. But now I green with a totally different group of people. Like, I'm not even just talking Tori and Cat, but like my old Monday Night group is even a totally different group of people than my Android. Then the group I played with when we had Android. And I basically got rid of it because the people I played with hated it. And, I'm, and it is not a bring it out to public play event game. It's a three to six hour murder mystery, super complicated, lots going on game. And just isn't suitable for, hey, sit down, let's play this. Right. So it made sense. But yeah, I should have I should have kept that. I wish we had kept that. I want to play it again. And maybe I get it now and play it again. And somehow I got rose tinted glasses and I'm like, oh, no, uh, Jeff, I think you're thinking of Android Netrunner, the card game, but I'm not positive. I don't think you can play Android. It's just called Android. I'm going to look quick because although they're may they're very well, well, maybe you can play almost anything on that uh, yeah. system, although I think uh, they are still uh no trying to search that doesn't work well yeah you'll get all the hits for netrunner no not even that just trying oh. to search android gives well, you yes. all the google there you go and <laughs> is it coming to android and i get it on this yeah no that's not a good search yeah one of those that's one of those game titles that just does not age well <laughs> yeah uh, right. it's not listed under dlc games but it's very well could be in the community yeah i'm sure it's there somewhere all right. I'm going gonna... I'm gonna to give up soon. Yeah, Android Netrunner is on Steam, but yeah. not Android, which is, I'm, I'm assuming that's what Jeff was talking about. Oh, this is a completely different game. This is. And yes, Ryan's saying Android the board game seemed ambitious and crunchy in its time. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and Dana points out here here's a good, weird, or unique game that was too weird for its own good. Because it just, it like, for some of my friends, it was unplayable. It was a murder mystery where you don't figure out the mystery. You determine it during the game. Right. And yes, Jeff would probably love it. Um, it it's it's a, a mix of How Ketchum and Who Done It all in one. Because it's all about trying to, to find the murderer, but the murderer is determined by, like, player votes in the middle of the game. And there's literal jigsaw puzzles you have to put together. All of this would be apps nowadays. Like, you would literally, you play in Runner, and you would go, oh, I have to do the code breaker, and they give you an app. Well, it's old enough game that they give you plastic, like like not plastic, cardboard pieces that you had to connect. Right. And there was a circuit board in the corner of the board, and you got points by connecting points on it. And like I said, the neatest thing is everyone's cars were different. So you actually have like uh, like protractors with a picture of your car and how far your car can fly every turn. And like one of the characters, their car is like super fast. So it's got like a long thing for moving around the board. And you literally have to use like a measuring tape thing to figure out if you can reach different spots. It, it might be great as an app. But like I said, the people I played it with hated it enough that were like, no, I, I <laughs> never want to see this on the table again. I'm like, all right. And like it was a regular who played all the time and then someone else didn't enjoy it. They didn't like the fact that their goal was to make someone the murderer and that person got killed. And they were like, it ruins the game because I can't win now. And I'm like, the thing they're missing is that it's a point salad. It's a point game. Just getting the murderer right isn't necessarily how you win the game. Part of it's keeping your character balanced because it's a noir and you have you have problems. All the characters have have issues they have to deal with during the game, and you have to keep your character balanced. You get points for that. And they like said connecting that circuit grid and whatever, talking to so many suspects, and that was all worth points. And you could very well not easily, but you could win the game without getting the murderer right. That was just an aspect of it, which is why we're like it's Philip K. Dick the board game. My, my favorite comment from the reviews on Android and someone else has actually commented, you know, who seconded it already is it's messy, inelegant and not well explained. But damn, if I don't love this game anyway. Yeah, no, no, it fits. 
it fits. It's kind of like us, our love of Fallout the board game. Like, how, like 25% of the time, there's going to be a player who gets totally screwed over. As long as you're okay with that, the game could be really cool. Another one. This game feels like a Frankenstein's monster made from three games stitched together. It's big and bloated. I love the idea behind it, but it's a mess. A glorious, glorious mess. Yeah, see, that's that's my memory. That's my rose-tinted glasses. I, maybe if I got it again, I'd be like, why do I get this back? Let's sell it. Yeah. I, I mean, it's a four. It. No. It's a, it's 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 a it's a oh, yeah. four. It's not yeah. a hundred and eighty minute four game. Yeah, think of it. Think of a thematic Amira trash game with a weight of four, basically, right? <laughs> like, what is going on? Yep. All righty. All right. Now we'll wrap up. I will read my last bit. We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. If you got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Thank you, everyone, for your questions tonight and for joining us here live.